Okay, we yeah, are I see the red light. Yeah, we are recording. <laughs> yes, because last week we forgot to record. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tonight we're gonna chat on uh, on insulin and sugar and how it's all linked to Alzheimer's. Mm. Which is uh, a big link. Did you guys know it was all kind of linked together? No. Um, no. Is this something new for you guys? Yes. Okay. All right. So let me, um, yes. Battery 80%. Connected to. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, to mute everyone so we can start our chat. And we will open up the chat box as usual. As you know, we can uh, discuss chat, comment on the chat box. Um, all right. And everyone got their chat box open? Yeah, type in yes if you got your chat box open, just so I know everything's set and ready to go here. All right, okay, got a bunch of yeses um, with that. Dr. Trin, I lost my picture. I don't know what happened. Your video is gone, you mean? Yes. Oh, are you on like, uh, let me see. Are you on uh, your laptop or your computer? Yes, you're hearing me okay, but the picture disappeared. So I thought I was gone, but I apparently I'm still here. You're still here, yes. You must have clicked on something that allowed you to lose that. I'm not yes. sure. Try. You can try going out and going back in and see if that refreshes everything. Um, I'm clicking on an arrow. Uh-huh. That's got somebody else's face, <laughs> not mine. Yeah. Hold on, hold on. Do you see me now? I see, uh, yeah, you, yeah, I haven't lost you at all. Okay, so I'm, all right, so is everything good? Well, no, I still don't see my picture, but I don't have to. But uh -oh. the thing is I can't see the chat either. Maybe oh. I should go out and come back in. Yeah, try going out and coming back yeah, in. Yeah, I'll do that. Yes, yes, yes. I see Marissa doing all these different. <laughs> all right, guys. Good, good, good. So let's, so how is everything connected? The first question I wanna ask you is why does, what is the function of insulin? Why does insulin even exist? Anyone know what is insulin? Why does it exist? Type in your thoughts on that. What is the role of insulin? Any, any thoughts on why Tina says control blood sugar? Okay. Insulin lets sugar into a cell the body. Marsha, Marsha, smart. Allow sugar to enter, regulate sugar. Yes, yes, yes. Where's insulin produced from? What organ makes your insulin? Pancreas. Yes. Uh, pancreas. Yes, pancreas. Anyone know the specific name of the cells in the pancreas? Ooh, Marsha. Okay, never mind. She's already got it. Uh, the islet, the beta cells, the islet of Langerhans. I guess some guy named Langerhans maybe created it or dis or discovered it. Beta cells, is that right? So, so how often is insulin made? How often is insulin produced in our body? When, when is insulin, you know, secreted by the pancreas? Any thoughts on that? When is insulin secreted by, by the pancreas? When we ingest, Vivian says when we eat, Diane says when sugar, when we eat after a meal. Okay, okay, very good. Is it after every meal or is it after any specific type of meals? Any specific types of meals? Sugar, yes. Yes, mainly mainly sugar because uh, insulin is designed to bring down your sugar, right? So when, when we eat food that has sugar, when I use the word sugar, am I, am I talking about mainly, I don't know, desserts, candies, cookies, you know, ice cream and stuff like that is, 
Is that where sugar is made from mainly? Where else can we get sugar from? Sugar cane. Sugar cane, yum. <laughs> Fruits, yes. Fruits. Honey. Uh, carbohydrates, yes, carbs. Carbs, carbs, carbs. Any types of, of carb will break down to, to insulin. But not all carbs is bad, is it? What are what are the the difference between good carbs and bad carbs? I mean, even even vegetables is carbohydrate, right? The veggies we eat, they're they're carbs, but they're not necessarily bad carbs, right? What makes a carb good versus bad? Anyone know? You guys are good. Let me see. Simple versus complex. Simple versus white. Um, Diane says complex carbs keeps you full longer. Uh, Dorina says sudden rise of sugar. Vienna says complex carbs is good. Lorraine says how it's processed. Yes, you guys are absolutely correct. So, so when a carbohydrate breaks down, and it goes straight into sugar, right? It goes, it breaks down and goes straight into sugar quickly into your blood. That is not good, right? When it spikes your blood. Um, and Jill says glycemic index. Yes, there, have you guys heard of the glycemic inde index before? Anyone ever heard of that term glycemic index? Yes. Yeah, what does it mean? What does glycemic index mean, guys? How do you define the glycemic index? How fast or slow sugar is absorbed. Dorina says how rapidly it creates free blood sugar. Yeah, yeah. How fast sugar is broken down. Yes, yes. The glycemic index is how fast uh, a certain type of carb or a certain type of food becomes sugar, right? How quickly it becomes sugar is what we call the glycemic index. And so how quickly it spikes your sugar, right? If you have a high glycemic index, it means the food that you ate becomes sugar very quickly. Boom, sugar, right? That's high glycemic index. Uh, versus a low glycemic index. So a carbohydrate that breaks down to sugar quickly causes a high glycemic index. And so, so that is sweets and desserts and, and sugar, right? It's also simple carbohydrates, white bread, white rice, um, pasta, you know, things that break down to sugar immediately and quickly it has a high glycemic index, potatoes, things of that sort. Um, and so it becomes sugar very fast in the blood. Now, complex carbohydrates, which is vegetables, right? They're still carbohydrate, but it's laced with fiber. And what happens is that the fiber slows down that breakdown to sugar, right? That absorption into sugar. And so, so you can have carbs, but as long as it has fiber in it, then it doesn't spike your sugar immediately, right? It's, it slows down that sugar absorption, sugar spike process, which is better for your body. Does that make sense to you guys so far? Right, like time release, right? Does that make sense to you guys? Uh, the glycemic index, uh, the difference between simple carbs versus complex carbs, because again, not all carbs are bad. Uh, only the carbs that spike your sugar quickly is bad. And so when we're eating something and our sugar uh, is high, that is when the pancreas goes to work to make insulin. Does that make sense so far? When we're eating something that has high glycemic index, meaning it breaks down the sugar quickly, then our pancreas goes to work. Our pancreas is like a factory, right? And, and it produces a widget. And this widget is insulin that's being produced. And so, so the role of insulin is to bring down your sugar. 
Is everyone following me so far? The role of insulin is to bring down your sugar. Does that make sense? Type yes if it makes sense to you guys uh, so far. Okay. Let me ask you this. What is the purpose of sugar? Why does sugar exist in our body, right? What is the purpose of sugar? The other name we use for sugar is glucose, right? Glucose is the other name. What is the purpose of sugar? Energy, okay, yeah. This is why, you know, when we see kids eat sugar, they're like all over the place and super excited, especially in children. Uh, it happens in adults too, by the way. Um, sugar is used as fuel, right? Sugar is used as fuel for your body, for energy, specifically for your cells, right? All your specific individual cells is, uh, is used. Fuel for cells via glycolysis. Holy cow, Dorina. That's like biochemistry you're talking about. But yes, sh sugar is used for energy. So the, the sugar goes, you know, into your cell and it, your cell uses it for energy. Now, let me ask you, how does insulin lower your blood sugar? How does insulin lower your blood sugar? We all know that insulin lowers your sugar. How does it do that? Any thoughts? Any thoughts? We got some super smart scientists here. <laughs> okay. Have you guys ever been to a hotel before where in front of the hotel, in front of the hotel is a, uh, is a hotel, uh, what do you call it? A doorman who stands there dressed up really nice in a suit tie and his only role is to open the door for you so you can walk into the hotel. Anyone ever experienced that before? Walk into the hotel uh, with a doorman opening the door for you. Anyone ever experienced for you that before? A hotel doorman take care of that hotel door. Yes, yes, okay, a few of you guys have. All right, very cool. So, so insulin, Insulin is the doorman that opens the door, right? That opens the door to allow for sugar to go inside from your bloodstream to inside uh, the cell, right? Inside the hotel. And once the sugar goes inside the hotel, right? Into your cell, then the cell uses it for energy. So insulin is just a doorman that opens that door. Uh, but insulin is needed to open that door, right? To allow sugar to go in. So when sugar goes from your bloodstream to inside the cell, then the level of the, the sugar in your blood goes down, right? This is how sugar uh, is lowered by insulin. This is how insulin lowers your blood sugar level. All it does is that it doesn't make the sugar disappear. It just moves the sugar from the bloodstream to inside your cell. And your cell uses that sugar for energy. So insulin is the doorman. Does that make sense to you guys so far? That insulin is a doorman that allows sugar to go inside your cells. Type yes if that makes sense. I want to make sure that I haven't lost anyone here. Right? I want to make sure that I haven't lost anyone here. Uh, with that. I'm taking a picture, you guys, by the way. All right. And so, hey, we got to do like a tongue out picture sometime so that we can all be on screen, stick our tongues out at the same time for a picture of all of us. Does that sound good? Does anyone like that? Oh, okay. Marissa's shaking her head no. All right. The, the rest of you guys can stick your tongues out later. Just remind me. Okay, so anyway, insulin is the doorman, right? It allows sugar to go inside and, and your cell uses for energy. Now, let me ask you this, guys. 
let's go back to the idea that sugar and the pancreas is a factory, right? It's a factory that, you know, that works, that has to go to work every time we eat. How many meals do Americans have a day? How many meals do Americans have a day, guys? Diane says six, Joanna says five, uh, Vienna says too many, Martha says five. <laughs> Marissa says six, too many, right? Too many. And, and every time we eat, six plus, really? Oh my gosh. Every time we eat, our factory has to go to work because of the American diet. The American diet is a pro-carbohydrate diet. Right, the the mainstay of our food, guys, the mainstay of our food is what? It's carbs. Right, we love our pasta, we love our bread, we love our rice, we love our potatoes. How many guys eat something as far as pasta or carbs every day? Isn't that the American diet? Right, every day there's there's carbs in our diet. Ooh, except for maybe Laurel says no, but. Uh, yeah, but most of us, we're carb eaters. It's the American diet. And, and that's what we do on a regular basis, right? It's carbs, carbs, carbs. And let me ask you this. If the American diet is a carbohydrate-based diet, how often is our pancreas working during the day? How frequent is this factory working? How often is insulin being made? How often is insulin being made, right? It's overworking all the time, yes. So breakfast, what do I have? I have, you know, cereal, I have bagels, right? I have uh, donuts, right? Some of you guys eat eggs, but our food, the American food is basically carbohydrate. So for breakfast, my sugar goes up, my pancreas is working, my insulin goes up, right? Mabel says cake. She has cake for breakfast, right? And so, so our insulin's being made, our sugar's high for breakfast. Insulin brings the sugar down. Many of us have mid, you know, after breakfast, you know, this snacks, right? Snacks between breakfast and lunch. There's a number of us that do that. And when we do that, our sugar goes up, our pancreas is working, our insulin level goes up again, right? And then uh, Dorothy said she loves cake for breakfast also. Great, we, have a, we need a cake group here. We need a cake Zoom group where we should get together and show pictures on Zoom of our cake. Does that sound like a good group to have, guys? Maybe not. <laughs> and so, and then we have lunch, right? And then we have lunch. And for lunch, our, our sugar goes up, our pancreas is working, our insulin level goes up. And by the time the insulin level starts to go down again, right? By the time the insulin level starts to go down again, what happens is that it's snack time. How many of you guys have an afternoon snack between lunch and dinner? Anyone have an afternoon snack here? Yeah? Oh, okay. Laurel says no. Joanna says yes. Diane has eats fruit occasionally. Yeah. So by the time our insulin level starts to go down, right? By the time our insulin level starts to go down, we have snack. And, and when we eat our snack, our sugar goes back up. When our sugar goes back up, based on what we eat, right? Our, uh, our pancreas is working again. Our insulin level goes back up. Okay, and by the time the insulin level is ready to go down again, it's dinner time. Are you seeing a trend here with insulin levels and sugar throughout the day? And what we are seeing, especially in the US, right, is we are seeing a state where we always have something to eat because of the American diet, right? Breakfast, snack, lunch, snack, dinner, snack, right? Post-dinner snack, midnight snack. And and so our pancreas is consistently working. 
our sugar is consistently high, our insulin levels is consistently high. The insulin level never has a chance to go back down. And, and this is what happens, guys. This is what happens. Over time, when your insulin level is always high, right? When your insulin level is always high, our body gets used to that. Our body gets used to high insulin levels. And when it does that, our body starts to ignore the effects of insulin because it's so used to it, right? It, it starts to ignore the effects of insulin that the fact that insulin is, is there. Like for example, my house, right? I've already fixed it now, but there was a time when the smoke alarm, right? These little smoke alarm on the ceilings here, it beeps all the time. It's like beeping, beeping, beeping. And, and why does my smoke alarm beep? Because the battery, right? Because the battery starts to, to wear out. And because, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, height challenge. I'm height challenge. You know, I'm only like five something. And I may not have, you know, a uh you know what do you call it? a ladder to fix the the battery what happens over time i start to like tune it out i tune out these beeps from my house from these little fire alarm things and and the reason i tune it out is because i hear it all the time and sometimes i don't even know it's there until i'm on the phone with someone and they're like what's that beeping noise behind you it's, oh, I'm sorry, right? It's, it's the little fire thing. And, you know, I haven't changed the battery yet and things of that sort. So other people would notice it. I would never notice it in the house because it's there all the time. It's beeping all the time and we tune it out. Our body does that to insulin as well because insulin is always there. We always see it. We never have a chance when we, not, when we don't see it because we're always eating, right? And so what happens when insulin is tuned out? This is what happens. It's like the doorman standing at the door, but he's just standing there with his arms crossed and he's not opening the door for you because we just kind of tune it out. So, so insulin is present but insulin is not working correctly, right? So what that means is sugar, sugar cannot get inside the cells because the doorman's just standing there and he's not doing anything. He's not opening the door. What do we call that? What is that condition called? Does anyone know the name of that condition when the doorman just stands there and doesn't open the door for you? Anyone know the name of that condition? You guys are good. Insulin resistance. Have anyone heard of insulin resistance before? Type in yes if you've heard of insulin resistance. Yeah, that's it. Insulin resistance is basically insulin being present but not doing its job right? Insulin is there, but not doing its job. Insulin resistance is pre-diabetes. Anyone ever heard of the word pre-diabetes? That is insulin resistance, right? Pre-diabetes. It is a hemoglobin A1C level, which is the hemoglobin A1C is the name of the blood test, right? That looks for diabetes. How many of you guys have had a hemoglobin A1C test before? Yeah, most of you guys have. Anyone not have a hemoglobin A1C test before? Right? At least once a year, when you do your physical exam, you want to make sure that you have a, a blood test called hemoglobin A1C. It is the blood test that looks for diabetes. Right? And I'll, I'll type out what, what that spells, hemoglobin A1C. There you go. Take a look at the chat. That's the hemoglobin A1C. It's the name of a blood test that looks for diabetes. Now, let me ask you this. What is the level? What is the hemoglobin A1C level that defines diabetes? Above what number? Anyone know? 
above what number is hemoglobin A1C considered diabetes? Close, 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 close. <laughs> the answer is 6.5, 6.5. So hemoglobin A1C above 6.5 is officially diabetes. And it measures your, your three month blood sugar average is what the hemoglobin A1C is measured above 6.5. What is the hemoglobin A1C? At what number and below are you considered normal? Normal. Anyone know? What is the hemoglobin A1C number that is considered normal? Below what number? Close, close. I wish do like a raffle or something where somebody gets the prize if they get the right number. All right. 5.7. 5.7, so below 5.7 is normal, above 6.5 is diabetes, okay? Below 5.7 is normal, above 6.5 is diabetes. So what do we call that span, that space between 5.7 to 6.5? What do we call that? What do we call that, guys? Between 5.7 and 6.5. Yes, we call it pre-diabetes. Pre-diabetes is when your hemoglobin A1C is between 5.7 to 6.5. That's when insulin is standing there at the front door of the hotel, but not opening the door, right? The doorman is standing there, not opening the door. That's between 5.7 to 6.5. Below 5.7, the doorman is opening the door because insulin is working, right? Insulin is working. Below 5.7, the doorman is opening the door. Above 5.7, the doorman is just standing there, not opening the door, okay? Insulin resistance is between 5.7 to 6.5. What happens above 6.5? What happens above 6.5? Diabetes, right? So, so you remember that the pancreas is a factory that is working. Every time we eat, that factory needs to go to work. And you recall that we eat as Americans, breakfast, snack, lunch, snack, dinner, snack, right? We're eating all the time, all day, right? That's what we do. And, and we talked about the fact that our pancreas, our factory is being overworked because we're making it work all the time because we're always eating, right? Frequently. And so what happens over the time when we have a factory that is forced to work by the time it wakes up for breakfast to all, to all the way to that midnight snack. What happens to the factory over time? What happens to the factory over time? Right? Yes, it, it's overwork. It breaks down. It burns out. It gets worn out. Yes, yes, it gets worn out. It burns out. Karen says, amen. <laughs> Is this like preaching or something? It, right? The, the church of uh, something. So anyway, this factory burns out. When the factory burns out and starts to burn out, that's a hemoglobin A1C above 6.5. Right? Today, ooh, Karen says today is the national day of prayer. Oh, wow. Yes. Yes. Thank you for the reminder uh, with that. God knows we need prayer in our country. With the pandemic, with everything else going on, so crazy. Yes, today is the National Day of Prayer. Thank you for the reminder. So, so this pancreas, this factory burns out. What that means, guys, is above 6.5, you have missing dormants, missing dormants, because when the factory burns out, it no longer makes insulin, right? When the factory burns out, it no longer makes insulin. 
So the doorman starts to disappear. So nobody's opening up the door for you anymore. Right? Nobody's opening up the door anymore. So hemoglobin A1C, you guys understand it now? Doorman opens the door every time with a hemoglobin A1C below 5.7. Between 5.7 to 6.5, the doorman's like standing there and he's like, he doesn't want to open the door anymore. He's on strike. There's so many doormen because the body's used to it. The body's so used to all the insulin that's in your, your blood, you know, 24 seven because we're eating. The insulin doesn't work anymore. It's insulin resistance. So the doorman's there. He just doesn't open the door. Above 6.5, you're missing dormants, right? The doormen start to go missing because we're burning out the factory. Does that make sense to you guys with the doorman analogy and, uh, and the hemoglobin A1C and, and sugar and all that? Does that make sense to you guys? That, how do you change this? Good question. Good question. <laughs> so our brain, the brain of an Alzheimer's patient, what is the name of the plaque that builds up in the brain? Anyone remember? Remember the, the plaque that builds up, the Alzheimer's plaque? Is there a name to that plaque? Anyone remember the name? Yes, 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 Anna amyloid, Dorothy amyloid, Vienna amyloid, beta amyloid. Yes, yes, yes. You guys are good. Beta amyloid, right? Or amyloid beta is the name of the plaque. And amyloid beta is a protein that builds up abnormally in our brain. It is a protein that builds up abnormally in our brain. Every patient with Alzheimer's have the plaque, right? This amyloid plaque. Every patient with Alzheimer's have amyloid plaque, 100%. Okay, and, and I know in a previous lecture that we have uh, done, We've talked about the fact that there are many things that causes amyloid production. There are many things that causes plaque production. You guys remember we talked about like toxins and circulation problems and right and and different things that uh, causes amyloid production, right? So there's a there's things in our lifestyle that leads to amyloid that leads to plaque production in our brain, right? To that leads to this plaque that builds up and it is attributed to Alzheimer's uh, with that. So, so maybe in another lecture, we'll go over and review those things with you, right? The different things that causes Alzheimer's plaque production. But we know that there is a process of plaque production that occurs. Did you know, yes, Vienna inflammation, inflammation is a huge factor behind amyloid production and Alzheimer's plaque, huge. So there's a process of plaque production and there's a process of plaque removal that occurs also. You guys, did you guys know that there's a process of plaque removal that occurs? Does anyone know when plaque remo removal occurs the most? Does anyone know how plaque is being removed? Alzheimer's plaque. Ooh, you guys are good. Holy moly. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it, a lot of it gets removed during sleep. Yes. Does that worry anyone here? You insomniacs like I am, right? Who don't sleep well? Yes, plaque production occurs often during sleep. And so, so the problem guys, isn't necessarily making plaque. The problem is an imbalance between plaque production and plaque removal, right? It's, you, we're producing more plaque than we can remove. And so if, if the removal of amyloid plaque, you know, isn't balanced, then you get all this excess production of plaque, which leads to Alzheimer's, 
Does that make sense to you guys? That an imbalance between plaque production and plaque removal. Does that make sense to you guys so far? That imbalance, right? I mean, I believe in, you know, imbalance in, uh, in our lifestyle, in, uh, in our health. Everything is about balance right uh, production versus removal did you know that every cell in your body is designed to have a birthday and a death day did you know that every cell in our body is designed to have a birthday and a death day nothing's supposed to last forever i mean you know your liver cells will last a, you know for a period of time and then when the liver cells get old your body goes in and your immune system eats up the old liver cells to make room for new cells, new liver cells to be born, right? Your bone cells, right? There is a process where we call it osteoblastic and osteoclastic, right? Osteoblastic is the process of making more bone cells. Osteoclastic is the process of removing old bone cells, right? And, and that process needs to be even. What happens when you remove old bone cells faster than you can make new bone cells? What happens? What do we call that, guys? Yes, we call it osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is simply imbalance. Imbalance, right? Osteoporosis is simply imbalance. So, so if you're a diabetic, and you're able to control your hemoglobin A1C and to get your hemoglobin A1C to a normal range with medication, with diet and things of that sort. Yes, you're helping your body to, to get back to normal uh, with that, okay? The, the problem in America is that two out of three of us in the United States are either diabetic or pre-diabetic. Two out of three of us guys are either diabetic or pre-diabetic, okay? Uh, Marshall says, can they see beta amyloid in a uh, functional MRI? Uh, we cannot see beta amyloid in a functional MRI. We can see beta amyloid in, uh, in a PET scan that is designed to see beta amyloid. It's done in clinical trials. Uh, we, you know, we offer these clinical trials at Irvine Clinical Research. If you guys are interested, uh, See what's going on in your brain. You know, I do these free consultations. You can just contact me for, for the consultations, uh, for the opportunity for brain scans and things of that sort if you're eligible, right, for these programs and clinical trials. The, the um, yes, Vienna did it with me a few years ago. <laughs> That's right. So, so every cell in our body has a birthday and a death day, and that's normal, okay? It is abnormal when there's imbalance, when there's imbalance in, in producing new cells and getting rid of old cells, right? Osteoporosis is simply an imbalance in not making enough new cells and, and getting rid of old cells faster, so we thin out our bones. That's osteoporosis, right? Um, what happens, guys, when there's an imbalance where you're making more cells of any type of cells and the old cells are not going away, they're not dying? What do we call that imbalance where you're making a lot more new cells and the, the, new, and the cells don't die? What do we call that? You guys are smart. We call it cancer. We call it cancer. Cancer is simply a cell not willing to die, right? Think about that. Cancer is just a cell not willing to die when they should be dying. That's cancer, right? Breast cancer. Breast cancer, over time, you have a, a, a you know, you feel a mass, right? A lump or a mass. That mass is a mass of breast cells that keep growing because those cells are not willing to die. Lung cancer. What do we see? We see a mass in our lungs that keeps growing. Be why is that? Because the lung cells are not willing to die. 
That's why you have a big mass that just keeps growing. Uncontrolled cell division. That's right. Does that make sense to you guys? The importance between the connection, right? Between how important it is to have a balance in our system between cell growth and cell death, right? It always needs to be balanced. Alzheimer's, right, is a problem with making a bunch of amyloid plaque and not removing the amyloid plaque adequately, right? We have a lifestyle that produces plaque all the time and these amyloid plaques, they're not being removed. That's how you get Alzheimer's. Is that making sense to you guys now with Alzheimer's and the plaque? It is the imbalance, right, of, of amyloid beta production compared to amyloid beta removal. Okay. What does that have to do with sugar and insulin, you say? What does that have to do with sugar and insulin? Right? Well, we know that uh, excess sugar, excess sugar, first of all, is toxic for our body. Right? Sugar goes to three different places when there's too much sugar. It goes to three different places in our body. Does anyone know the first place it goes to where it deposits in our body when there's too much sugar? Anyone know? Darina says liver. Yes. Yes, Marsha. Yes. The first place that sugar goes to is our liver. Okay. Is our liver when there's too much sugar. Okay. Now the pancreas makes, uh, yeah, you pee it out. You pee it out in your kidneys. But uh, when there's too much sugar, it deposits into your liver in the form of fat, right? We, we call it glycogen. Glycogen is being produced. And, and that is how we make fatty liver. Anyone ever heard, heard the word fatty liver before? Yes, fatty liver is basically too much sugar, guys. That's all it is. It's too much sugar. The sugar gets converted to fat. Right, And when I talk about sugar, I'm talking about carbohydrates. Breads, rice, pasta, spaghetti, pizzas, the American diet, right? The American diet leads to fatty liver. Why is fatty liver a problem? Fatty liver is a problem because it causes inflammation to your liver so that your liver does not function appropriately. And as the inflammation progresses, Right? As the inflammation progresses, it causes you know, cirrhosis. It can cause a dead liver. That's right, Lillian. It can cause cirrhosis from fatty liver. How many of you guys have been told you had fatty liver? Right? Treating fatty liver is not that hard. It just, well, it is hard, but it's, but it's not complex. Treating fatty liver simply means, right, cutting out sugar cutting out carbs, losing weight as a result, right? That's how you treat fatty liver. So that's the first place that, um, that too much sugar goes to. The second place that too much sugar goes to is what? Does anyone know? Is there a good test for fatty liver? Yes, there is. Anyone know the test for fatty liver? Anyone know the test for fatty liver? The initial test that we use to detect fatty liver is a blood test, actually. The, it's a, the initial test is a blood test that looks essentially for elevated liver enzymes. Elevated liver enzymes is usually how we initially detect this. We don't normally go looking for fatty liver. We do a physical and we notice, hey, you got some elevated liver enzymes. Let's try to figure why that is. Right? Let's figure out why your liver enzymes are, are elevated. And so, so the first thing we do, oh, what's the name of the liver enzyme? Yes, um, let me spell out the name of the liver enzyme. ALT and uh, AST, right, is the, the name of the liver enzyme. It's also SGLT um, is another name of the liver enzyme. 
Um, we also look at uh, Billy Rubin uh, is another one as well uh, for your liver enzymes. So these numbers are elevated when we do your blood test. And we're like, why is it elevated? And so let's go for a hunt on why your liver enzymes are elevated. So we can check for like viral hepatitis. Do you have, you know, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, hepatitis C? We'll check those things, right? Another blood test. But when those things are normal and your liver enzymes are still elevated, then we do a liver scan. Uh, it can be an ultrasound, right? Like a liver ultrasound, a simple liver ultrasound uh, will detect fatty liver. We can see it on an ultrasound, right? I mean, some people do CAT scans and there's fibro scans and different things, but, but a simple ultrasound, right, will detect fatty liver. Uh, and if you have fatty liver, you now know how to treat that because it simply means too much sugar, right? Does that make sense to you guys so far? We can't see your notes. Wait, could, hold on here. Uh, da, 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 everyone in meeting. Okay, uh, can you see my notes now? All right, so, okay, so liver enzymes is AST, ALT, uh, Billy Rubin. Let's see, Billy Rubin. Uh, these are some of the Billy, some of the liver enzymes that we look for. Um, and in this workup for elevated liver enzymes, we can do a, a liver ultrasound, right? And that liver ultrasound, we can see the fat in the liver. And, and the treatment's very simple. Cut out on carbs, cut out on sugar, and, uh, and that will cause weight loss. And weight loss normally uh, takes care of the fatty liver as well uh, with that. Okay? So, yes, SGOT as well. That's right. And... Uh, so there's a number of different things uh, with that. Now, this, that's the first place that you get when you have too much sugar, the, that uh, sugar deposits to. The second location that sugar deposits to is your fat cells, your fat cells. Sugar goes into our fat cells and it makes us what? When sugar goes to our fat cells, what does it make us? <laughs> Oh my word, yes, it makes us fat. Yes, two out of three Americans are considered overweight. Fat sells fat. Two out of three Americans are, are overweight uh, based on the body mass index, right? Uh, the BMI uh, with that. So again, when we have fatty liver, it causes inflammation to our liver, can cause cirrhosis and kill us. Uh, when we have, uh, oh, Dorina says uh, COVID-19 pounds. Yes, that is another definition of COVID-19. It is the 19 pounds that we all have gained from sitting at home, being quarantined and isolating and all that. Absolutely correct, right? And so, yes, uh, sugar, too much sugar, based on the American diet, uh, goes into our fat cells and makes us obese. Uh, with that. So forever I have been taught when I was young that if you're obese and you're overweight and you're fat, the diet to be on is a low fat diet. How many, how many of us have been taught that if you want to lose fat, you need to be on a low fat diet? Anyone have been taught that? Yeah. So let me ask you this, if everyone in America is on a low fat diet, why is it that two out of three of us are still overweight? If everyone in America knows about a low fat diet, why is it that two out of three of us in the US are overweight? <laughs> well, it's because it's not necessarily the fat guys, it's the sugar that's making us fat. We, are, we have all been focused on a low fat diet while we're eating our breads, our carbs, our rice, right? It is the sugar that leads to obesity. 
most of us don't think about that, do we? Yes, we link sugar with diabetes, but have you ever linked sugar with obesity, right? It is the carbs that we eat, right? And I'm not talking about the complex carbs. I'm talking about the carbs that break down straight to sugar, right? The, the high glycemic index carbs with that. So that's the second place that sugar goes to is our fat cells, right? It does get into our muscle cells and other cells as well, but it goes into our fat cells and makes us fat. The third location that is affected by sugar is, is what? Does anyone know? Anyone know? Okay. <laughs> sugar, uh, and this is a long scientific thing. Sugar attaches itself to everything in our body uh, that's in the bloodstream, right? It attaches to other proteins floating around the bloodstreams and it, it forms what I call protein uh, sugar tails that are floating along with proteins that are floating around because these sugars, what they do is they attach to these other things floating around in our bloodstream, we have cells floating around. We have red blood cells, white blood cells, molecules, proteins, a bunch of stuff in our blood, right? And all these extra sugar that's in our blood attaches to these other things and they hitchhike on them and they cause little sugar tails. Yes, glycosylation is what we call it. That's the term, right? Glycosylation. And so it, it forms these sugar tails and these sugar tails, they have names to them. We call it advanced, right? Does anyone know? Advanced what? Anyone know? Dorina, do you know this one? Advanced, uh, advanced glycation end products is the same thing as sugar tails. Um, and so if you ever look up you know, these types of words, right? All it means is sugar tails floating around. And these sugar tails, what happens is that the immune system, when it looks in your bloodstream and it sees these sugar tails floating around, the immune system doesn't recognize the sugar tails. And as a result of that, the immune system attacks the sugar tails. And in the process of the immune system attacking what it doesn't recognize, it creates inflammation. It creates inflammation as a result of this attack. And not only does it create inflammation just once, it creates inflammation every time we eat. If we're eating the wrong food, we're making sugar tails. And so what we have in our diet, in the American diet, is a process of chronic inflammation, long-term inflammation that, that we create because of our diet of excess sugar. And chronic inflammation leads to problems such as such as Alzheimer's. Are you seeing a link between all this? Between nutrition, diet, sugar, sugar tails, inflammation, Alzheimer's, right? The production of beta amyloid protein, right? The production of beta amyloid protein. Dorina says, what is the structure of amyloid? Yeah, we can Google that. We can Google that. Do you guys want to see what amyloid beta looks like, the structure of it? Do you guys want to see what's causing, right, behind Alzheimer's? Let's do it, guys. Let me share my screen. Let me share my screen. Let's see here. Okay. Can you guys see my screen? You guys able to see my screen here? Type in yes if you do. I want to make sure everyone can see it. Okay. All right. Let me pull over the um, the chat box. There you go. Okay. So let's take a look. Let's take a look. Um, beta amyloid plaque uh, structure. Let's take a look, guys. Let me close this down. Let's look at images. 
Here you go. Do, 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 do. Let's see here. Let me pull up a big picture of it. My beta amyloid. Let's see here. So you have what's called the amyloid precursor protein that's broken down to beta amyloid. Uh, amyloid beta. Here it is. This is the beta amyloid uh, structure. And what happens is that they form into a plaque. They connect together uh, over time. And as they connect together, they form into this big plaque that uh, Mabel says looks like party debris. Yes, party debris, exactly, is what it looks like. Let's, uh, here you go, beta amyloid. It forms into a big plaque that gums up your brain, that gums up your brain. They're mainly in the brain, little green men, little green men, right? They're mainly in the brain. Uh, with that is what we're seeing. So, amino acid or sugar. These are amino acids. These are proteins. These are proteins. Beta amyloid plaque. These are protein. And here's what they look like in a uh, in an electron uh, little microscope. You can see the plaque in the hippocampus. You can actually see the plaque itself. So when we do uh, autopsies, right? When, when we do autopsies of patients with Alzheimer's, uh, that's what we see. We see those plaques. Now, uh, amyloid uh, specific to Alzheimer's is different than a condition called amyloidosis, uh, which is a different type of amyloid as well. The amyloid of Alzheimer's is beta amyloid. Now. How does this, what does this have to do with insulin? Do you remember that the problem with Alzheimer's and the problems with diseases in general is an imbalance between production and removal? You remember that? In Alzheimer's, in Alzheimer's, it is an imbalance between the production of beta amyloid and the removal, right, of, of amyloid, right? The removal of beta amyloid, where you produce more than you can remove. Now, let me ask you this. How is this connected to insulin? Two out of three Americans are either diabetic or pre-diabetic, two out of three of us, okay? Two out of three of us have too much insulin. Insulin resistance right? This insulin always floating around in the blood. Insulin always floating around in the blood, okay? Let me ask you this. Insulin cannot float around in the blood forever because it needs to go away, right? It needs to disappear to make more insulin. Otherwise, your, your body's gummed up with insulin all over. So in the, insulin is produced and insulin is degraded. Does that make sense so far? Insulin is produced and insulin is degraded. Type in yes if that makes sense. I'm gonna tie it off for you right now, okay? There is an enzyme that degrades insulin. There's an enzyme that degrades insulin. What is the name of that enzyme? Does anyone know? Does anyone know the name of the enzyme that degrades insulin? Protease, <laughs> that's an official name. And you guys are going to be surprised at something like this. So the integrin, the insulin degrading enzyme is called, is called insulin degrading enzyme. That's the name of it. Okay, that's the official name. Okay, there's an enzyme that takes away insulin. Where is it? It's in the blood. It's in your blood and it takes and it eats up the insulin, right? It degrades the insulin. It's called the insulin degrading enzyme. Now, insulin degrading enzyme doesn't just degrade insulin. It has another job. Does anyone know? 
what this next job is. Does anyone know what the other job is of insulin degrading enzyme? I'm gonna share my screen and we're gonna find out its job together, okay? Let me look up here. It has two jobs, right? The first job is to degrade insulin, okay? Now, did you know that the first job while it's degrading insulin, how often is it doing its first job compared to its second job? Is it spending most of its time doing its first job or most of its time doing the other jobs? What do you guys think? In America, with our American diet, if insulin degrading enzyme has two jobs, was it, what is it doing most of the time? Is it doing its first job, which is to degrade insulin or is it doing its other jobs? Does that make sense to you so far? It has two functions. All right, so, so it's spending all its time degrading insulin. The reason it's spending all its time degrading insulin is, is because insulin is always there in our bloodstream, right? We're always eating. We have breakfast, snack, lunch, snack, dinner, snack. So right? the insulin is always there in the bloodstream. So insulin degrading enzyme is always busy trying to degrade insulin, always doing that. It has no time for anything else because we always have insulin on board because of our diet. Does that making sense to you guys so far? Right? We're keeping it busy doing its first job. What it's not doing is that it's not doing its second job because it's so busy doing its first job. Let me show you what it's doing with a second, what it should be doing with a second job. Okay, let me show you what it's supposed to be doing in a second job. Do you guys see here what its second job is? in this sentence. Insulin degrading enzyme, right? It's, a, it's an enzyme that degrades insulin and amyloid beta. Degrading and taking down, taking away the amyloid plaque is its second job. But we are keeping insulin degrading enzymes so busy with its first job in taking down the insulin because we're always eating that it does not have time to take away amyloid beta. It does not have time to remove the plaque. This is why diabetes is called, or this is why Alzheimer's is called diabetes type three. Are you seeing the connection? Are you seeing the connection now with insulin and Alzheimer's? We are making so much insulin because of our lifestyle and our diet that we are so, that our insulin degrading enzyme, which has two jobs, is always busy trying to take away the insulin that is being produced, that it never has time to take away the amyloid plaque. And if it's not taking away the amyloid plaque, what happens guys? The imbalance, remember the imbalance of amyloid? We are creating that imbalance because we are keeping our insulin degrading enzyme so busy doing its first job, it is not taking away Alzheimer's plaque, which is why Alzheimer's is an epidemic in the United States. What do you guys think? Are you seeing the link? It's all based on an enzyme that's not degrading the plaque because we're keeping that enzyme so busy trying to take away the insulin because of our diet.
that is not taking away the Alzheimer's plaque. So the plaque builds up and gives us Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. Lecture's done. <laughs> you can totally unmute now in chat. <laughs> what do you think? It's That's incredible. Fascinating. It's, it's very simple. Yes. I, I had no idea. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Really good to know. <laughs> so what do we do about it? You cut down food that you cut down on food that causes insulin to be produced. And do you restrict the hours over which you eat? You can. That's a good way to, to do it. But you cut down on the sugar. You cut down on the carbs. The insulin degrading enzyme goes through, is in your blood, because your blood goes up here, right? Into your brain as well. That's why it's also up there as well. And so its role is to degrade amyloid plaque. But we keep it so busy degrading insulin that it's not doing a second job. So if a person wants to have a snack, and uh, all you see is a banana in the house. Would that be <laughs> too high? So you would do strawberries or banana, uh, strawberries or blueberries instead of that banana? Healthy How bad snacks. is that banana? Healthy snacks. Healthy snacks. Yes. You have to trade off. So I was just wondering, you know, which, which would you select? Right. Well, I mean, if you burn off your sugar, it's no big deal. But the problem is we eat sugar and we don't burn it off. Right? We don't exercise, we don't do anything to burn off all the extra sugar that causes the insulin to be produced uh, with that. Yes, the role of diabetes medicine is to, you know, there is to bring down your sugar. But some of the diabetes medicine, all they do is they make more insulin. It's what they do, right? Glipizide makes more insulin, insulin shots make more insulin, and, and all that uh, with that. And so, exercise. So I'm I'm diabetic and I take Tresaba at night and I give myself 14 units. So I'm on the way to becoming Alzheimer's, what? I'm no, you're, the reason you, we gave you diabetes shots, uh, insulin shots, is because your pancreas is not making insulin, right? It's kind of like burnt out. And so you need the insulin shots uh, to replace your pancreas function. Uh, so, so that's not the problem. The problem is our, our diet, right? The problem is our diet. Our diet always keeps our insulin level high because we're eating stuff that keeps the insulin levels high. And so our, you know, and so our insulin degrading enzyme, which should be removing plaque, is not because it's busy taking down all the insulin that we are producing from our diet. I understand. Yes. But uh, Alzheimer's, is it, is it hereditary? There is a gene for Alzheimer's. Uh, it's the ApoE4 gene, uh, but that gene, you know, it's not the main thing that causes Alzheimer's um, because our lifestyle is more important than our genes. Okay, because my father has a frontal lobe degenerative disease now, and he's like now I go see him almost uh, every week, and it's really getting. He's always sleeping and he's not well at all. Yeah. It's, He's always saying, okay, 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 so. I know, I know, that's, it's definitely hard. Martha says, can it, you give us a one day food sample? <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a fan of the Mediterranean diet, uh, which is a plant-based diet. If you look at the Mediterranean diet, uh, the majority of it is plant-based. Uh, less meat, less meat, more plant-based. Uh, and, and that's the, what I'm a fan of as far as nutrition. Uh, with that. Yes. Insulin degrading enzyme. I taught you guys something today. Yay. Fantastic. <laughs> you're, you're a champion. So, you're a champion. I love you. All right, guys. It is 718. I've gone <laughs> overboard again. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Thank God you. bless. And, uh, have a great day today and uh, we'll see you next Thursday. Okay. Thank you oh, so yeah. much. All Thank right. you so much. Great, great, great lecture. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Very good. Dr. Turin, you have a, another presentation on May 10th. 
Who am I teaching on May 10th? <laughs> uh, talking about the COVID-19. Oh, okay. You know, the question and answer. Oh, okay. Well, thanks for the reminder. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I hope you remember it. All right. Somebody remind me on May 9th, okay? Happy Mother's Day to everybody, eh? Happy Mother's yes, Day. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Green. God bless. Bye-bye, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.